How many of you have used Docker? Any? Some? I know Bill has. Uh, how many of you have Docker installed on your laptop? So what I thought I would do was talk a little bit about the architecture of Docker. There is a pretty good getting started document that I can, we can walk through, if only because it, ex it, it uh, exposes some interesting things uh, in the getting started as you're verifying your environment. And I can use that as a talking point for some of the vocabulary, which I'm still unsure of, and it's a little bit confusing. You would do it very high level over what Docker is? Right. So we here at Gaslight, um, and as you alluded to also, we, um, we run a lot of projects. And we move people around, not terribly frequently, but sometimes. And so what happens is, is let's say that a project, we finished it up and we hit our milestones and everybody's happy and we get paid and the world is fantastic. And six months later, the customer comes back and says, I need one more thing. And so we go find two available developers, and this is one of my favorite quotes, Jerry Weinberg, if you, this is a free tip. If you've never heard of Jerry Weinberg, he's known as the consultant's consultant, and he's like the Dale Carnegie of consulting. And he's written a lot of fantastic books with cheesy titles on them, but every page is just cram full of wisdom. And he says, what is his, his trick question is, what is the number one criteria for a consultant? And you might think poise, you might think you know, domain knowledge, you might think it is uh, charisma or empathy or I don't know what. He says the number one criteria is availability, <laughs> which is <laughs> actually true. And so that's often how we get people on projects here at Gaslight is who's available. So we stick somebody on a project and they haven't, they either, best case scenario, they were on the project to begin with, but they haven't looked at it for six months. Worst case scenario is they've only ever heard about the project, that it was running somewhere over in the corner at Gaslight, and now they're on it. Check the code out, and you type in bin server or server start, or you don't even know how to start the application up. And you don't know what are all the dependencies. You read the readme file, you hope for the best. You look at the gem file, and maybe that gives you some clues. We pretty much always use Postgres, and so that's a pretty good start that you need to have Postgres installed on your machine. Um, but it's kind of a little bit of a nightmare. Uh, the other thing that we do uh, when we onboard new designers, which are front-end implementers by the, by the large part, they, part of their onboarding process is to shadow the other designers. So to help foster relationships among our design team, they go and spend a week with each other designer on whatever project they're on. So they walk in, they show up, and they have to get their machines set up to do work on for a week, and then they move to a new project. And they have to get their machines set up to do this new project. And then they go to this other project, and they have to get th their machines set up to do this project. And so it's all this hodgepodge. You know, we'll use, I, I started a new project eight weeks ago. We used Rails 5. Rails 5 had been out for like a month and a half. The project before that, we were on Rails for whatever it was. The project before that was also Rails 4, but there's all these different versions of Rails, all these different versions of Ruby, all these different versions of whatever tools there are. Goodness, how many versions of Node do we have running here in the office? There must be a thousand versions of Node floating around. How do you manage all these dependencies? And for me, this was the big selling point. I wanted to fully encapsulate all of the application's environment and its dependency into something that you could check out with the Git project. You could do a Git clone, and boom, you had all of your dependency specified. And that is the goal that Docker is trying to do. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump over here to this overview. And this is complicated language. Um, the main thing is that it's, this was what I was mainly shooting for. Encapsulate the whole application into one environment. 
So now when a designer comes onto our project, theoretically, if they already have Docker installed, they should be able to check out the project, which all of our designers are Git fluent, and then just run the container. And it will go out and fetch and resolve all the dependencies, just like a gem file manages all the dependencies for a Ruby project. It's like a couple steps beyond that. It says, oh, I need Elasticsearch installed. I need, uh, I need Postgres installed. I need Redis installed. I need all these different services that all have to be plugged together. And I have to know how to set my configuration up so that they all tie together. And there's all this time that you have to spend with a new project making sure everything's wired up. The project that Tim is on right now it pretty much requires a solid week for an experienced developer to get their environment running, which is ridiculous. Well, they have, they, there's like an eight-page PDF document of instructions. For all the dependencies on how to get this done. So we put a new, we put a new developer on this project, and they're going to pay us a ridiculous amount of money to do nothing but just get the local dev environment set up. That seems crazy to me. It seems crazy that it's that complicated. It seems crazy that we don't yet, in 2016, have a way to just quickly instantiate a development environment and go. And that's what Docker's trying to solve. And it largely does, with some caveats. All right, so here's the picture. They have lots of pictures that I don't like. Here's one of them that I do like. So they're calling this box your Docker host, and Docker is client server. And what they mean by that is that there is a command line interface which does not have to be running on the Docker host that can access and interface with the Docker environment. For me, I run all this on, the, on my local host, just like I've always done all my Rails development, and everything runs on my local host. We have one guy on our project, he's a client, he's a developer from our client, he's on the project with us. He's actually running his Docker environment on a Linux box hosted in a virtual environment because he's got a Windows machine and he doesn't want to switch to a Mac. We tried to get Docker running on his, Mac, on his Windows machine and it's not surprising that it's not supported very well there and some of the networking stuff didn't work the same way and we couldn't get it to run and so I said, don't do that, it hurts. So here's the way that this works. You have a, a Docker daemon that's running, and you can see mine. It is, if you go all the way over, it's the second to last icon, which is this little whale. And it has, he says he's running, and you can do all kinds of things with him from here. I almost never touch this. I do everything from the command line. And the command line is the client that interfaces with this daemon. You specify and you load containers. This is mainly what you work with. These are running application instances, and those things are instantiated from images. This is language that's a little awkward. You can put images in a registry. And so there is a Docker hub, and you can define images in this registry. And so when you specify in your environment that you're gonna use an image, it just goes to the registry, gets it, pulls it down, and runs it. And everything is wonderful. All right, so with that said, what I would like to do is walk through this um, install, if you guys are interested. Uh, you can pull out your machine. Um, and most of us here have Macs, thankfully, and so everything should be fairly straightforward, and I'm not going to have to argue about that. Um, it's pretty simple. You come to this, you go to docker.com, and you can, um, there's a getting started link on docker.com. Right here on the front page. And he's going to say, hey, look, I think that you're probably on a Mac. And so you click on Download Docker for Mac. 
Once you have that done, and you just drag that to your applications folder like any other Mac and app and launch it, it should launch up and put that up in the up in the uh, menu bar. And the interesting thing is that now you have these commands that should be available to you uh, from the command line. And I'm not sure how they show up in the command line. I suspect the Docker app puts it there, but I'm not sure how it does that into your environment. You may have to like, just open your favorite terminal and start typing. Yeah, that seems magical compared to actually putting something in your Bash RC or something or Homebrew installing it. It doesn't say to do any of that stuff. So let me know if you get that if you get that working. Is that what it does? So you drag you drag this icon into the applications folder and at launch time it copies it to user local bin? That's what which docker is telling me. All right. I'm okay with this. <laughs> <laughs> it did ask for a root. Whatever it's installed the first time. So this to me is like all the mag all the magic right here. And I'm going to run this locally so you can watch it happen. I'm going to increase the font on this so that it is roughly readable. No. Copy that. Paste that. So what he's doing is he's docker run in minus d a daemon mode and he's mapping port 80 to port 80, and I'll talk about that in just a minute. He's giving it a name web server, and he's specifying the image Nginx. And so then what he says is, I don't have an Nginx image, so I'm gonna go to the registry and fetch the Nginx image, I'm gonna download it, and I'm gonna download what other, other dependencies that it has, and I'm gonna start this image up under the name of web server. I keep wanting to type that. And so now what you see is, if I make this a little smaller, maybe it'll wrap better. Now what you see is here is this image, Nginx. I have a container ID, and then these three right here are my other application that's running in my other tabs. But this guy right here, so what he's done is he's created a running instance of the image, and the image itself has compiled into it the entire Linux environment needed to host Nginx into one big image. So it downloads Debian, it downloads all the stuff that you need, and, and all the stuff that Nginx needs, and it's all in this image, and I have no sysadmin commands to, to use it. This mapping of port 80 to port 80 is saying inside the container there is a Linux instance running. I want port 80 of that mapped to my local host. And so most of these images like the Postgres instance or the Redis instance or the whatever instance that you want, most of those images are already going to export specific ports and says this port is available for mapping into the local environment and that allows you to connect to it from the outside. So now when I go to my browser, and I load this page up, he says welcome to Nginx. Now I can come back to the prompt and say docker kill and I'm going to give him this container ID and he stops it and now when I come back just to show you that there's no tricks up my sleeve machine says nobody's listening on port 80 and so this image is actually still there and so now I can restart it and now it's running again 
Now, if I wanted to remove it, I can do that. So let's say that I actually, I did this a minute ago. I want to, I've stopped it, I've killed it. Wait a minute, before you remove it, what happens if you turn uh, web sharing, or what is it, web sharing on, on your local host and you try to fire the do that? Where does the error come from? So it is not running right now. Not sharing, sharing. And you're saying that I could enable or internet sharing. Is internet it? sharing it does porting. Why can't I turn that on? I think that's the local. No, this isn't internet sharing. This is like if I was port forwarding or something. I want to do something like what is it? Web. I don't even know how to do that. What's the built-in way to turn this on? Oh yeah, it's not a button anymore though. Like you have to run like patches. Oh, okay, maybe not. Well, just for an error. So if I, you're saying if I already had something on well, port, like start a Rails instance on port eighty, do sudo or something, and start. So I actually do have a Rails instance running on port three thousand, and so let's just try to rerun this. So he's saying I can't re I can't create a new image named web server because I still have one. So what I can do is do a let's uh, that's what I was trying to do. I want to do an a right. Docker Sorry, this, I can, RM web in. server. Can't remove a running container. Kill. Remove. So now if I do a Docker list, no. Docker info, no. So now I'm gonna try and rerun this guy like this. So he says right away here, Bill, and it's at the bottom of the screen so that you can't see it. I tried to start him up to run on local, local on 3000. I'm mapping port 80 inside the container to the 3000 in my environment. And he says, it's already allocated, can't do that. So what I wanted to show was that once that guy was already up, it was already in use by a container. So if I say docker run web server, no, that's not it. I don't do this very often. And I'm, this is only really a novelty because you usually don't interface with the docker command directly. Uh, and we'll get to that in just a second. So here's this image ID. And now I can say docker run. I give it that image ID, and I think that it's running in the foreground now. Nope. No such container. Not images. This is why you actually should prepare things. I wish I could, I'm trying to look for the list of containers and I thought it was maybe PS. PS says he lists containers. All right. So this command, and I don't, and like I said, Docker is not how I interface with this all the time. What we actually use is this other command, docker compose. So what we end up doing is, you, for your individual application, we're going to create a docker file. And that would be the recipe for how to build an image for your application. 
And what you might be tempted to do is you can run all kinds of Debian sysadmin commands inside this Docker file. But what you want to do, and they call this a microservice architecture, because each container should only be running one single application. So we typically put the database and the Rails application in the same environment, but they want that separated out. So if you have, a, a, let's say, a complicated Rails environment that has Rails running, has Postgres running, has Redis running, has Elasticsearch running, and maybe has Memcache running, those would be five separate Docker containers. And they would be, and, and so the question becomes, you could launch all those things individually and then manually wire them all up together. But this Docker Compose is a simple way for you to specify in one batch file all the microservices that your whole application environment needs. And so what I end up doing is using Docker Compose to start and stop the whole application all at once. Now there's a step beyond that, which is called Docker Swarm, which manages multiple environments across a whole host of machines. So Docker machines would be individual VMs, if you will, that are running containers inside them. But these VMs could be on one host, you could have multiple VMs on one host, or you could have those VMs spread out across many hosts. <coughs> and so Docker Swarm is the tool that would be used to manage that network meshed environment. I have not done that, and I don't know how robust that really is. I had hoped that we would end up being able to deploy, once we did the work of setting up our dockerization of our application, that when we did the deploy, everything would be smooth, and there would be sysadmins everywhere going, yay, look at this, you've given us this nice configuration file, and we can set it up and go. And the answer is that that's really not the way that it happened. That when you start talking to people about hosting Docker containers, there's lots of words about it, but it seems really complicated to do, and I think you have to be a real sysadmin to do it. So my hope was to replace Heroku. We host 90 some odd percentage of our stuff on Heroku. My hope was to replace Heroku with Docker containers that we would develop locally with Docker. We would have all of, all of us running the exact same environment, running inside these virtual containers, and then production would be running the exact same environment. As you know, when you host in Heroku, your local dev environment is not the same as what your Heroku environment is. There's lots of things that are hidden from you about your Heroku environment that every once in a while can bite you. And so my hope was to actually have production, real production, be exactly the same as development and have development be an environment that was palatable enough to work in. What I found was that Docker it creates a very consistent environment to do development in, and I'm not yet smart enough to host it in a production environment. Okay, any questions so far? And I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna show this picture. Any questions about what we've seen so far, Tim? Do you use Docker for the CI project? No. What I have seen is that you could actually push images but what CodeShip does, that's what we use for our CI, and we looked at, for this project in particular, we looked at other CI tools, um, but CodeShip, what it does is it still checks out, runs your environment as a undockerized environment, and then what it can do as a final step is build your image and push your image to a registry. So what that would mean is, is that when you do local development and you push it to CodeShip, CodeShip says you're green, it's going to upload your application image up here, and then your local environment would be set, instead of always building the environment, to check out the, to check out the image. So we're not doing that. And so right now what happens is when we're in rapid application development mode, our designers, when they check out code, they do a git pull, they sometimes have to rebuild their containers because our code has changed underneath it. And we can talk more about this mechanics of how, um, of how those images, when they need to be rebuilt and why they need to be rebuilt and things like that. 
But that would eliminate that step. They could pull out an image which would represent the, la the latest passing SHA of the application and just run it, and it would just run just like Nginx did. You would say, Docker run, and give it the name of your application image, and it would go out and fetch the image and run it, and you wouldn't actually have to have anything locally to, to actually run that. But that's not what we're doing. James? So the, the code ship feature is in build your image, is that specific to Docker, or is that just like a hook that you can say, run this command and upload this artifact somewhere? Now that's a good question. I don't know the answer to it. I suspect that it's, you have to pay them lots of money to do Docker, and so I suspect that it's probably Docker specific. Any other questions so far with what we've seen? I do think that being able to, and even though I can't do it anymore because I screwed up my local environment, being able to um, run images, to pull down images and run them is pretty hot. Now this is, not, this is kind of a trivial example because it's just Nginx and you say, well, how do you get the files from Nginx to, to, to access? But in most of my environments, when you say I need Postgres, I need Redis, I need Elasticsearch, I need Memcache, there's, it's basically just this. We just specify these services because our application container is the only one that's really unique to us. Everything else is just kind of out of the box. So we say, yeah, give me a Redis instance. Boom, done. Give me a Postgres instance. Boom, done. And there's nothing that you have to do except specify that you need it. Well, we don't actually, I mean, of, 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 of Redis, we don't configure Redis, right? Right. Well. <laughs> we don't configure Postgres hardly ever. And if we needed to, then what I would probably, what you would have to do is you would create a new image <coughs> that would inherit from the Postgres image and override its, the, um, the pieces that you needed to override. There's a, I didn't know there was a notion Yes, and I'll get to that in just a second. Rob. And you can defer this, this is part of what you're gonna to get to in a second. So do you have, do you basically inherit from an Nginx to put your Rails code in? Not Nginx. Um, or, and or Apache or something. I mean, do you, do you essentially say, well, I'm gonna start with the web server container and I'm gonna add my application, which is running as a behind the web server. So you have Docker Hub, and you can just come up here and search and say, for instance, Rails. Well, here is an official Rails image. And he says, don't use this. Go to the standard Ruby image instead. And so what you do is you create a Docker file for your application, which inherits from Ruby. And what that, and you specify what version of Ruby you want. And so that says, I'm gonna give you an image that is a Linux, a Debian system that has everything needed to run Ruby successfully in it of whatever version you need. And it handles all of the dependencies for that, of which there's not a lot, but it handles that. And this is actually true. And so then he says, you know, how do I use this? And he talks about what to put in your Docker file here. And he gives you a pretty good example of how to get started here, although it's not that great. Um, I'll give you another example. Let's go and look at Postgres. Here's the official Postgres image. And you, here's the versions of Postgres that are supported. And so what you do is you simply say, you could just give it this command, just like we did before, docker run, and then you give it the name of your instance, Postgres, and this would do the latest version of Postgres, but you could specify an image name of, with any of these versions on there. That's one way to do it. The other thing that you can do, and it should, talks about extending it if you wanted to do different changes here, and I'm trying to find where, it doesn't mention using this in a Docker file, but, or in a Docker Compose, but I'll show you that here in a second. But this is like 
This is like the first line of your Docker file. It says, I'm inheriting from, and you give it an image name. So this Docker hub is pretty handy. You can look for <coughs> Elastic, and there's the official Elastic search. You can look for, if you're old school, you can look for MySQL. You can look for <laughs> SQ. Why would you need an image for that? I guess maybe. Okay. Somebody do. Somebody do. So, like with the Postgres image, so you spin that guy up, and then you're using it. Is it storing the data inside the container? Yes, it is. So that data is pretty ephemeral at that point. What you would have to do is. Uh, configure that image and we can talk about linking volumes. So what I do for local development is I'm linking things outside the container to things inside the container on my hard disk. And for me, the actual database for local development, I don't map that. I just leave it. Um, and it, I think it might automatically map to somewhere in VAR. I don't remember. I mean, when you say it's ephemeral, is it is it like every time you restart the container, or? No, it's not every time I start the container. I can start and stop the container. I'm just not sure where it's mapping that to. It okay. could be if it wasn't, but I think by default, yeah, here it is. Uh, you give it, uh, it by default maps your local, uh, on your local host. This is your, your, this is your Docker host file system, var live Postgres data maps into the containers file system. And then the server writes to that inside the container. So there's like a, it's almost, you could think of it like an NFS share between this Linux box that's running in a virtual environment that's sandboxed and your local host environment, which is hosting that, it maps this file system into it. And that becomes really handy when you're doing application development. Because what we end up doing is we map our application, we have a Git, a cloned repository in our local box, just like always. We map that into our, our Rails container. So as we make changes, the container picks that up and runs it live, just like always, because they're linked together. And that, co that there's actually a little, and this is part of the problem with Rails because you're not running Ruby or Rails in locally. You're not running your bundle install locally on your, on your Docker host. You're running it in the container. And if you don't map your, if you don't persist, for instance, your bundle directory where it's going to install your gems, then that is ephemeral. It's stored in the image. And so when you stop the image and start the image back up, it's starting with the copy of the, of the gems that existed at the time that the image was built. So I'll show you here in just a second. I also map locally my, my gems into my container. So I have a version of gems that are built into the image, and then I can locally go through and run bundle, and it will all work. It, it writes it into the images. They're all kind of mapped together, and I'll show you that in just a second. So there's a mapping not only of ports, you know, we mapped a port from the inside to the outside. We're also mapping directories from the inside, from the outside to the inside. All right, enough talk. Well, no. Let's look at more things. So here is the Docker file. Now, frankly, I'm not sure how to increase my font inside Space Max. It does not work. Space Plus. Space Z. Space Z. F. Plus. Except I think I've screwed something up. Let me go back. Maybe I'm like here. Okay. Okay. 
space Z F plus 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 more and biggin. Yes. So this is this little app, it doesn't have much to it. And thankfully I mentioned earlier I have no JavaScript. And so there's no client server to this. In my previous app, we were actually, my previous project, we were actually building two apps, right? We had the client app and we had the server app, and they happened to be in the same repository. Dockerizing that application is more complicated, and I worked on that for a little while, but then I got bored because I wasn't getting paid to do that. I was getting paid to do this one instead. So this is the Docker file that I have, and what you see is that we inherit from Ruby, and then we have to install some stuff. This basically puts the Postgres libraries on there because the Ruby image doesn't include Postgres by default. I don't even know why I have no, J no JS. <laughs> I think I just copied that from something on the internet. You knew about that. I set some environment variables here. Um, the, this appdir slash app is the directory that I want to host my application in the container. And so I store that off the variable, I create that directory, and I set that to be my working directory, and then I'm adding files into that container. So initially, the container's file system is completely empty. I've created the actor, and now I need to like bootstrap my application into that directory. So I'm adding gem files to my local host into that actor. And then I run bundle install, and that basically bootstraps the whole application. Finally, I'm adding everything in this directory into the app chart. Now I do that for, for re the reason I do those in two separate steps. I could do that line 12 up above line 6. But when building the container, it caches every step. And so if you, you don't want to copy your whole application into the container every time you want to run a bundle install. And so this allows it to get down to the last step, add. This one, that line 12 is going to be different almost every time you start the container because you're making changes to your code base. You don't want to have to run bundle every time you make a change in your code base. So you separate those two steps out so that your bundle happen separate, and you don't do that very often, and that gets cached when you're building an image. So, wait a minute, let me, let me make sure that my brain interprets that way. Docker is aware that when it runs line six and adds your jump file, jump file lock, if they have changed. And so, so when you go to build, the build your image, it knows the last time it built the image what the MD5 sum was of your gem file and gem file.lock. And if the MD5 sum has changed, then it will re execute step six and then do step seven, step uh, 11, and step 12. If the MD5 sum has not changed, then it knows it doesn't have to add those in. And it knows the bundle command will rerun, but it knows it doesn't have to do anything. And that will actually, and I don't know how it knows line 7 doesn't have to be rerun. Actually, line 11. I don't know what, how it knows. Probably because it has like a checksum of the disk on the image. And it says nothing has changed. So line 11 is cached. And now I'm going to run line 12. So I'm going to actually see if this works. And I haven't done this in a while. But I'm going to do a docker compose build web. So there you go. He is saying, let me increase my font here. He's saying that all that I already have this image downloaded. I don't need to re-download it. I've got this he I have to run these install commands. It's cached. I don't need to do it. I set this up, there's this environment variable, same cache, make dir, cache, work dir, cache, adding the gem file, cached. Well, actually my gem file's not cached. 
So what he has to do there is he's got a container that he's building and he says, oh, I'm not cash anymore. I have to start doing work. So he invalidates his previous container and starts a new one. And now he starts running these commands and they're not fast. Bundler is pretty fast to say, hey, guess what? The image already has these gems installed. Your local environment already has these gems installed. He says, I'm using, 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 using. Here's something new, I'm gonna install it. Well, because we're starting from scratch, there's nothing on the system. So every time you build the image, he has to install every gem, which is slow, and you don't wanna do that very often. And I'll show you how I worked around that in just a minute. All right, I'm gonna let that run in the background. And I'm going to show you my other goodness, which is the Docker Compose file. This is a straight up YAML file. Um, you can see we specified these services. The version one of this file didn't have that indented. But when you name these things as services, inside the Docker daemon, there is like a network set up. And each of these services that are named here, EB, Web, Bundle, become host names. And so in your Rails configuration, you can see that um, I have the DB image, which you just specify as being Postgres. I'm mapping my local database directory to the temp directory. And I do that because it helps me with doing uh, snapshots, PG dumps, and PG restores. That now I can have the PG dump files and PG restores on my local environment, and I can execute them inside that container. Here's my web. He doesn't specify an image. All he does is he says, build the Docker image that's in this directory. So it looks for the Docker file and builds it. And then it executes this command inside that Docker component, inside that image after it gets built. And then I, I mount my current directory into the app. I have my port 3000. I specify that I depend on the database and then I pull volumes from this bundle image. So what am I doing with this bundle image? I have this, the bundle uses the image from the web. So he doesn't do anything. Once the web is built, he just says, okay, I'll use this image. He just has a command that does nothing. And then he has a volume called slash bundle. And that is where You see that I specified in here that my bundle path is slash bundle. So this service, in essence, will preserve my bundle between instances of the, of the, the command. So I don't have, every time I add a new gem, I don't have to rebuild my image. I can do bundle install like I usually do. The image, because we're not, if we were sharing images, and somebody grabbed my image, it wouldn't have all the gems in it because I haven't rebuilt my image to have the new gem in it. I'm just installing it locally into the container. The image that the container is instantiated from doesn't know all my latest gems and be, until I rebuild it. But because I have this microservice, which is just a cache of, of, of gems, I don't have to rebuild my image all the time. Okay. Mm hmm. That sounds bad. I haven't done this in a long time. I wonder if my environment's still running. Yeah, I'm still running. Everything's fine. Nothing to, no, nothing to see here. Okay, so how does this work in practice? Remember, you have a local host and you have a container host. All of your environmental commands, running your test suite, running your Rails commands to generate things, running your rake task, all of that happens in the container. 
not on your local host. If you want to run Rails console, all that stuff runs in the container, not on your local host. That said, the container doesn't know, it has your Git repo, but it doesn't come with Git installed in it. So you can't run Git commands. It doesn't know about your GitHub identity. So what I end up doing is I keep a shell open locally, and this is where I do Git stuff. And actually, I do ag from here as well, though I usually do that inside Emacs. Ag is not installed in the container. So then I have here, and I'm going to bump this up. What I have here is I'm going to run, you can't see that very well because it's down at the bottom. What I'm saying is I'm going to run, Docker Compose, I'm going to run a command with this service and replace the command with this command, with everything that follows it, replace it with that. So inside the Docker YAML, I have the command specified to be bundle exec rail server. And what I'm doing on the command line is I'm replacing that command with this command, which is just bash. And so what that does is that starts a new container. My server is running in a different container. This starts a new container, which gives me a bash prompt, but they're sharing the same bundle directory. So when I run bundle install from inside the container, he says, yep, everything's fine. Even though my image doesn't have an updated list of my gems. And my server picks that up and everything's fine. So I can run Rails console and I can connect in and I can do all the things that I normally do. I can run bin rspec, which this takes about 20 seconds to run my test suite. It does take more overhead because everything is running inside a container, right? It doesn't have, the Docker says that they're faster because they don't have a hypervisor and I don't know what a hypervisor is, so I can't tell you why that's better. But for the most part, it works out okay. All right, so how do you actually configure this? This web application depends on the database and really the only thing that I have to do is let's go to config database YAML is I specify here, my username is Postgres and that's what the Docker image defaults to the root pass root user being, and you could specify that is different. And then I just specify it's on host DB because that's the name of this service. That becomes a host name. That then I can I can wire those up together. Now, if I was using Redis, if I was using Memcache, if I was using Elasticsearch, which I did on the other project. You would just reference those things by host name in your Rails configuration files just like you normally would. Except you'd be pulling those things off of the hosts and it would all get kind of wired together. Do those things get like name space somehow? These host yeah. names? Yeah. Because I can I'm mean, sure you have DB and other apps that are using Docker, right? That's right. Okay. So it takes care of that stuff for you. Right. So it knows that this host name, it just, it just does a, a host name lookup within the Linux environment. And I don't know exactly how it wires all that up, whether it's actually using a DNS registry or whether it's using a shared Etsy host. I don't know how all the Linux gets wired up. Oh, but so if you were in the shell and you said, in fact, we can actually try it right now. I'm in the shell, host DB, not found. Uh, so I guess what I was DB. is, like when you're thinking, when you're setting these these Docker Compose files up, do you have to think about like, oh, I better make sure that this, I'm going to call the database server DB, but I better not call it that because I'm going to have multiple apps on this same development workstation, so I better call it like my. Oh app no 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 yeah, they're encapsulated. Docker Compose gives you one cohesive environment, okay. and if you had another. Docker Compose file and you were running that environment, then those would be separate from each other. Okay. So you could be running multiple Docker Compose environments 
and they're all completely encapsulated and isolated. Okay. You could have them all running at the same time and it would be no big deal. Cool. All right. Any other questions? So where are you running your editor? Where am I running my editor? Localhost. Okay. I'm running this on localhost and everything in this directory is mapped over into my apps container. And so as soon as I save those changes, because Rails is as Rails does, he just, the, the Rails server picks up those changes and just re-renders, right? Re-updates his, his, just the way he does dependency management or, or cache, ca class caching or whatever. Can you do an LS in that directory? Can I do what? Can you run LS in that project directory? Yeah. Does it look just like a normal? It looks like a normal. It, it, in fact, normal it looks exactly like running LS here because they are exactly alike. Except the difference is, is that LS on my local host has fancy configuration options and LS in the container does not because it's a stripped down version of LS. But that's exactly what this mapping of volumes is doing. It's saying take this current working directory of the Docker Compose file and mirror it into the container. Now what's interesting is you can go up to, this is a regular, this is a regular Linux system. So when I go to the parent directory, which is root, it looks just like Linux, right? Except there's my app directory where I've mirrored all my stuff into, and there's also my bundle directory. If you had like native extensions, yeah. your Docker file would need to compile, part of your Docker file, one of your steps would be compile this for this architecture. That's, that's actually kind of awesome because it, a lot of times you, or at least if you're working on a compiled package, uh, sometimes you need to build something under the architecture you're going to deploy to. Right. Right, so from that standpoint, the architecture is the same in production, even though maybe my actual configuration and all that kind of stuff is not, because I haven't figured out how to do that yet. So I want to upgrade from Ruby 2.2 to Ruby 2.3. Yep. So what's the process there? The process there is I would take this Docker file and I'd update that line and I would build a new image. Cool. And if you wanted to upgrade Rails, it would be the same, right? You would go into your gem file, you would update your Rails versions in your gem file, and it would be the same way that you upgrade Rails today. Yeah. You're just doing it in the container. And if you wanted to update your Postgres version, I don't specify you can see here in my Docker Compose, I don't specify. I could do like that to say I want this image of Postgres specifically 9.5 and not 9.3. And if I wanted to upgrade or downgrade, I could specify what version of that image. And then all I would have to do, assuming that that's a valid version number, all I would have to do is go over to my server, stop it, and restart it. And what it would then do is it would go fetch the new Postgres image. It says, oh, I don't have this image. I'm going to download it and then instantiate it, just like it did when I said start Nginx. Yeah. And, and the same is true if the Postgres image has been updated to something later than what you did before. Right. If I said version 9 and the new version came out, the next time I started my app up, it would say... No, if, you just, if you just left it as Postgres, I'm assuming that's like... Latest. The highest. That's right. It's, it actually says, I, uh, except I've killed my logs. It actually says it's Postgres colon latest. 
And if there's a new image for that, then when I go to run it, it says, hey, your image of Postgres latest is not the same as it's supposed to be, and I'll give you a new image. Oh, cool. Which maybe is a dangerous thing. To so do. for those tiny percentage that aren't deployed to Heroku, how do those get deployed? I'm not answering any deployment questions. <laughs> I'm not trying to be facetious. What I'm saying is, is I don't have nothing about what I've done has addressed your deployment issues. I think you can use Docker to deploy. I don't know how. And I think that the answer is just like there's a Docker Compose YAML, there's a Docker Swarm YAML, which specifies how many nodes, what their IP addresses are, and what containers run on those nodes. And, and beyond that, you don't have Gaslight doesn't have clients that are deploying Docker directly. No. The first time I did Docker was because Bill needed to stand up an AWS instance for the project he's getting ready to show. And I was like, man, I don't want to do sysadmin on this box. Well, sure, certainly Docker could solve this problem. And the answer was no, it didn't solve our problem. <laughs> and so then we started the project that I'm on now. And I said, well, let's start from scratch with Docker and everything will be happy. And it has been, for the most part, that our team works on it and things just work. Um, but I can't host it with this. And I wrestled with hosting for, for three or four days, and I finally said, this costs too much money for me to mess with this. I'm just going to push it to Heroku. It's too bleeding edge right now for, to deploy. And if we, had, if we had Joe Rockland sitting in this room, he might tell us otherwise. Yeah. <laughs> right? There might be people who've been doing Docker from longer than me. I've got like nine weeks in this. I would say DigitalOcean has some really good guys that I've seen a lot of people point to several times and it's really good for themselves. Codeship also has a lot of guides that they've done on how to do this. How I ended up writing a lot of the, writing my Docker file came from um, Codeship's examples. And getting this piece of it this was this took this took some fighting. There was a couple days where we were cursing Docker because we had to do a bundle install from scratch every time we wanted to add a gem, and we were doing a Rails project from scratch, and we were adding gems like every ten minutes, <laughs> and that was pretty painful. But now our process is pretty pretty seamless. The main thing is you just have to figure out which window am I in? Am I on localhost or am I inside the container? And then I do everything inside the container. And Emacs doesn't know how to run my test anymore because I haven't configured it to do it inside the container. I have to do it from the shell, and that's okay. All right, I've been talking a long time. I'm ready to stop. Anybody else have any questions? No, the only observation I was making there was um, that to change versions, you kind of have to know that what level you are in kind of the Docker stack, because you mentioned gems, you just change, change your gem file. Um, Ruby version, you have to change it in your Docker, uh, Docker file. Mm -hmm. um, Postgres, you change it in the uh, Docker, Docker Compose. Compose right? So it's like, you really got to kind of pay attention to where you are in the stack as far as Yeah, I think it is definitely more complicated to keep this architecture in your head day to day than it is when you say, I've just got all this stuff installed on my local host. And I only have to manage that when I switch projects, which is in reality not that often, but switching projects can be pretty painful. Uh, and we all use either RBN for RB, E and V, and we try to do things to keep our environments changed. Sometimes we do global gems installs we haven't i haven't done that for a long time but i've seen some of the people here still doing global gym installs typically designers will do that and then you have the nightmare of how many versions of node do you have installed on your machine and every time you switch projects you have to figure out are you using node end and homebrew and all kinds of stuff this it's a little bit more complicated architecturally but it does fully encapsulate your application's dependencies in one cohesive environment. It's yet to be seen. We only have, I guess I thought we had two projects. We only have one project that's actively using Docker. 
and I would like to see us using more, but we have not yet replicated. I gave up and used Amazon. All right. And that's all I have to say about that. Good job.